Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm just going to plug this all in so that I have power and vision, at least technically. Um, yes, brilliant. Okay. Well, thank you very much for um, having me here and, and staying. I give um, talks about guerrilla gardening to all sorts of different audiences, um, to horticultural clubs and, and architects and students uh, and all sorts. So um, I, I have tailored this to, to the audience that I believe is out there and uh, whoever might be watching us um, online. And it is not, just to clear this up, um, anything to do with those kind of gorillas. Uh, in the English language, the words are pronounced almost identically. It's actually much more closely related uh, to those two characters on the left there who I photographed on a, a market stall in Amsterdam last summer. Of course, Che Guevara and Mao Zedong. And regardless of their politics, and I, I'm not actually going to go into their politics at all, uh, both of them wrote two books on guerrilla strategies. And uh, those strategies are, are very relevant to guerrilla gardeners. And the reputation of those two men is actually extremely relevant for why guerrilla gardening even has its name. Because the, these two men, have, well, they're, they're worthy of being put on satchels sold in market stalls. They have become icons of courageous grit and heroicism, um, even, even though the, the campaigns that the two of them uh, were fighting for have, have failed um, as they envisioned them. And, and they are icons in that way, and as a result, the word guerrilla is used to describe everything from knitting to comme de garçon shops to uh, spontaneous restaurants. It's a word that's uh, massively overused, and, and my background in, in advertising um, is, is um, guilty or... Um, responsible for, for that as well. And, and that was the context uh, for which I, I came across the word. But it's, it's one that I think is very important to define because in the context of guerrilla gardening, it actually does have a lot more meaning. This is, this is what most people think of guerrilla gardening. Uh, here are some more images. It's people um, generally in the evening when you're not face-to-face uh, -face with potential contractors and authorities uh, going out there and transforming usually public land, sometimes private, usually neglected land, but by no means uh, always, and just growing stuff, whether it's for beautification or whether it's actually for food production. And I mapped out in the, the front of my book hotspots. Well, frankly, th this map is pretty meaningless. These are the references in the book um, that, that I cover. But actually, guerrilla gardening is, is happening all over the place, even if people don't use that term. And it's been going on for hundreds of years. It's a pretty simple act of going out there and gardening if you don't happen to own the deeds or have permission for the land. But it's become, it's become much more popular recently because I think the issues um, behind why people do it now are becoming um, greater. In fact, that's why we're here today in, in some ways. And... The media have played a part in that. They've, they've picked up on my blog, um, they've picked up on other people's blogs, and here are some headlines um, from, from the last few years, um, reporting, thankfully, uh, the movement in, in pretty supportive and, and quite light-hearted um, terms, uh, spreading, spreading the idea further around. And it's not just the conventional media as well. The, the informal media is also spreading the message. Uh, this is um, some... Uh, Graffiti art in San Francisco, I believe. So, back to the word guerrilla. It's actually Napoleon who is the man that triggered the guerrilla response. He was invading uh, what is now Spain and Portugal in 1813, the, I the Iberian Peninsula Wars. And it was a response by the local population um, that uh, gives the word guerrilla. They were largely farmers, and they were to there to protect their land and their, their crops and their livelihoods from these imperialistic forces going in there thinking they know better how to run a country and what to do. And these were not organised soldiers. That's the difference. These people were motivated from within. They knew what they wanted to achieve and they went about pragmatically, sporadically, um, albeit with the help of uh, the British and Duke of Wellington over the other side of Portugal, but they did manage um, to, to, to push him back. And they were called the guerrilleros, the little war, the little soldiers, and throughout then the 19th century and into the 20th century, um, those tactics of, of guerrilla warfare, as it became known, uh, have become much more popular. But 
old Che, well, his image is used um, to, to advertise newspapers um, and, and the church in, in Britain. It, it, is, it is very, very overused. But I think in the case of guerrilla gardening, we are doing something that is like those original fighters. It is about our land. It is generally about local people in their local area. Um, and it is illegal, incredibly. It is illegal. Uh, in, in Britain, what I do is classified uh, as criminal damage. Um, I've not been arrested, but I've been threatened with it and been given the choice. And the, the authorities' response is usually uh, turning a blind eye um, or sort of admitting a sense of confusion. It puts them in a difficult position because if you take the activity of guerrilla gardening to a logical conclusion, uh, it is anarchy. People just seizing land, thinking they know what's best for it without any discussion uh, b beforehand. But um, we're a long way from that at the moment. And in my experience and, and the guerrilla gardeners I've met, what we do is actually a step towards permission and legality and recognition and legitimization. It is the action rather than the conversation that um, gets us there and shows, shows people what can be achieved. And so I'm going to show you um, a lot of illicit cultivation of someone else's land. Now, the, the context for, for the origins of, of guerrilla gardening was New York in 1973. That's where the term was, was first coined. And New York in 1973 was a pretty, well, it was a pretty exciting place, I suppose, um, a pretty grim place by um, today's uh, common standards for how you judge a, a good city to live in. It was going through a pretty bad economic slump, which is a bit worrying for New York now. Um, they, they, their boom of the 20th century had, had waned significantly, and people were leaving the city. They were migrating uh, off to New Jersey, uh, depopulation. Central Park, uh, Frederick Law Olmsted's jewel in the crown of Manhattan, by this point, uh, Johnny Carson joked, had squirrels in it that were addicted to crack cocaine. It was not somewhere you wanted to hang out, um, let alone wanted to, to go and do some gardening, um, which is why Michael Winner set his film Death Wish in Central Park uh, in 1973, which is the beginning of the guerrilla gardening movement. In the same year, the New York Dolls um, in, in downtown in the East Village, and John Lennon released his Mind Games album, which actually included lyrics about gorillas and um, sowing the seeds of revolution. So it was, a, it was an exciting time, and in that context, uh, a, an artist called Liz Christie uh, and uh, fellow artists and students formed a group called the Green Gorillas. Uh, they toyed with the name the Radical Rhizomes, but chose against that. I think um, the, the mood of the time certainly made the word gorilla relevant to them. And they started in this location um, on the Barry and Houston um, uh, cross street with... Um, clearing away the, the old fridges that had been littered there and, I believe, burnt out cars. It, it, Donald, who was a green gorilla back then and is still involved in the garden, was telling me it took them about a year just to clear out the, the muck before they could actually start growing anything. And it had been seeing litter growing, that is, the seeds from discarded tomatoes that had actually given them the idea, and they could see the potential in the landscape. So they got together, cleared this away, and within two years, um, this is Liz Christie herself, this is uh, the garden um, as, as it became, you know, a, a, a beautiful patch of, of young trees and um, poppies there uh, and vegetables. And it is still there today. And the path between that first illicit act and 35 years on um, has been pretty bumpy. In fact, when I went to visit there two years ago, the, the place had only just um, saved itself from massive redevelopment because New York is a very, very different place today. Um, Population has been increasing, land pressures are immense. And they'd got there and they've stayed there this long uh, because after about a year and a half, uh, the city authorities saw what they were doing and thought, this is fantastic. We don't have any money as it is. I mean, at this point, New York was paper thin away from declaring bankruptcy. And they embraced the, the volunteers. They said, look, you can, you can do this. Um, pay us a dollar a year rent. And the land actually was private. But because the landowner had abandoned it and he wasn't paying his sanitation taxes, the city was able to take it back as theirs. And 
the, the, the path towards a lot of these guerrilla gardens in New York, because this was the first um, which inspired many others, and Liz was driving around in her blue Datsun, um, tools laden in the back, um, helping people start theirs. The path was bumpy because of the development pressures, because Giuliani, both as a housing um, uh, representative and later as mayor, didn't like this movement uh, I mean, he, he dismissed them uh, on a local radio station as a bunch of communists, didn't like them at all, didn't want anything to do with it, and was keen to sell off the land uh, and, and develop on it. But when Bloomberg came in, the land of 600 of these gardens was handed over to the Parks Department, and they are now treasured as, as miniature little green oases in, in the city that, of course, bring many other benefits um, beyond just the, the plants themselves, benefits to the people. Now, briefly, my story is only four years old, and I was unaware of any of this history or even the term. Um, I moved to this flat. I still live there in uh, the Elephant and Castle districts of London. Uh, as you can see, I don't have a garden up there, um, but I, I missed gardening. I grew up in the southwest of Britain. I'd gardened as a kid. I'd gardened previously in London. I'd had window boxes, but I'd never been so involved as to think, well, I can't live anywhere unless I have my own garden. It occurred to me living here, that right outside uh, in the neighbourhood, in the public beds that in theory were meant to be being looked after by Southwark Council, there was the potential for me to just make my own garden. It was as, as simple as that, a, a, an act of um, domestic pride um, as much as civic pride, and it was not about um, uh, doing anything more than just making my garden and recording online how that garden went. Uh, you can see there on the top left-hand corner what it was like the first night I went down there. I, I added in some fairly um, unambitious cordline astralis and some cyclamen, quite popular with municipal planters in London, uh, and gradually added bits and pieces to it, cuttings that my mum gave me and, and friends passed on. We've got some sage in there that was being chucked out from a display at the festival hall, some Japanese and enemy... And that went very well. I faced no um, opposition uh, at all. Uh, to be honest, the word guerrilla seemed rather an exaggeration at that time. Um, and I began blogging it. In fact, oh, I've got some more pictures here. They, well, the garden spread. There's a lot more than just that little square by the front door. There's a great cascade of brick planters. And if anyone's in London, do go and see it. It's there, you know, by the roadside. So this was it um, more recently. And I set up this website just as my own blog um, of what I was doing. And over the subsequent year and a half, people came across it. Um, I came across uh, other people's uh, references to guerrilla gardening. I discovered there was a lot more going on out there. And it's now a pretty busy website. It's still my blog, and there's a community section on there um, with people contributing from, from around the world. There's a, a board for the Netherlands, which I can't understand any of it because it's in Dutch. Um, Although um, I, I am aware of guerrilla gardening going on in the Netherlands, and I, I visited um, a, a few guerrilla gardeners um, last summer, which I'll show you in a moment. So as a background now, I'm just going to, to, to give you the, the, the context that I think links all of us together, whatever our motivations as guerrilla gardeners. Um, sort of the, the fundamental issues it is one of, of resources. When, when I say we're fighting... Um, we're, we're fighting, as I see it, uh, the scarcity of, of land. Land is a finite resource, and uh, the, the neglect. And it's a contradiction, really. If you haven't got much land, you think, well, you're going to make good use of it. You're not going to leave it neglected. But we're not rational creatures. We're not all organized across this planet in regimented um, squares matching our, our resource need. Um, things are chaotic. And, and guerrilla gardeners, I, I feel, are, are a way of... Um, Resolving that anomaly, um, avoiding the bureaucracy and, and sort of tight sorting it out, making the best of what we've got. But population pressure, that's the old you know, scary chart of how quickly we're um, filling up this planet, um, and uh, our increasing need to be living uh, in, in dense conurbations like here in Sao Paulo. Obviously, the, the well publicized statistic that more than half the world since uh, 2006 now live in cities means even greater need to make the most of the patches of land uh, in these cities and beyond. Here's a photo um, I took of uh, a roof in, um, of a barge in Amsterdam, uh, Patrick Blanc's wall in Paris, um, 
city farm ideas, tower blocks of, of agriculture, and uh, the islands off the coast of uh, Dubai called the world. Those four slides are examples of other things you might want to do, given the uh, restrictions uh, on resources and the absence of land. But for me, a lot simpler than doing any of those grand and, and in the case of high-rise agricultural buildings as yet realised, um, is to start um, at street level, you know, bottom up, quite literally. Shit's been um, a topic of conversation uh, a lot today. There's, there's some dog poo I uh, photographed in, in Berlin. And these really are where guerrilla gardeners should begin with. A tree pit that uh, is currently functioning as a, a cycle park. Um, obviously, the tree is providing some benefits and a pet urinal, but could be a lot more productive, um, both um, in terms of vegetation to eat, but just aesthetically for the spirit of people walking down that street and as a way of um, getting people together, engaging people uh, in a shared activity. The photograph on the right uh, has since been cultivated by me and fellow guerrilla gardeners in London. That is prime central London. That is within minutes of uh, St Paul's Cathedral. This is not some inner city ghetto uh, that, that one might expect perhaps you know, is lacking the, the, the priorities or the resources or won't benefit that many people. However you want to rationalise it, it is incredible um, these locations are there in some of the world's uh, most um, expensive and, and dynamic cities. And this is it. This is the simple starting point. Uh, a verge um, at the Elephant and Castle. This is opposite my flat. You can see on the left-hand side the contractors have recently done some re-turfing, but uh, they appear to have run out of turf and the will to do the job with any sense of flair. So left the, I mean, you might think perhaps rather artistic, zigzag edge of turf just rolled out over the old um, ground. So I seize that as a, a great opportunity to have some fun, uh, an evening out doing a bit of gardening with my friends and filled it with some lavender and some campanula and some primula. That is, I did um, eventually because this is where the police um, surrounded us and threatened us with arrest if we didn't put down our tools, um, which was incredible. It was incredible. The video is online. The Guardian newspaper happened to be there filming um, for uh, uh, an article they were doing and captured the whole embarrassing incident, embarrassing that is for the police uh, incident uh, on film. Uh, I have many of these transformation photos just to show you the, the, the potential in the land and, and each of them have their own story. I won't go into to all those details now. This is um, a very large central London location again. You can see the familiar cordyline astralis that the council must have planted a few years ago and, and tufty grass and weeds that uh, in, in, in this kind of location, to me, is not fulfilling its, its potential. And we chose to fill it uh, with lavender, Lavandula angustifolia. Very, very popular with the bees. And we've heard the bees are very important. And you go down in the summer, it's swarming with them. And the aroma is actually there all year round, even when they're not flowering. We harvest the lavender at the end of the summer. We've done this for three years now. Dry that out, stuff them into little pillows, then sell that to raise more money for more gardening. It took us four nights of about 20 different people doing this patch. Um, nobody's ever come and challenged us about this at all. It transpired and this is actually relatively typical, the land is confused space. The cycle path in the middle, uh, you can see it a bit more clearly here, is the dividing line between two different borough councils, uh, except you know, the, the space is obviously designed as, uh, as one, with this division um, being fairly irrelevant from the point of view of horticultural maintenance. Um, and what could have been perhaps um, horticultural one-upmanship between the two different boroughs competing with each other um, as to who could do the most spectacular display on either side of their boundary, um, I think a simpler solution, of course, was just um, minimal uh, maintenance and, and neglect. So we've, we've taken it over. That's another photo at a different time of the year with the red poppies. And it's, it's like a stage. Gardening here at night, because there are the, the um, traffic lights, means that there's a constant um, static, well, temporary static audience. It's like being a street performer in Covent Garden with sort of people slowly passing by and they roll down their windows and, and inquire what we're up to, um, generally offer support if they've heard about um, our existence. And it's, it, guerrilla gardening then 
sort of become something else. It's not just about growing stuff. It's not just about getting out there, having some fresh air. It, it, it really does become some kind of th theatre. It depends on the location. It depends how you want to go about gardening. I don't mind chatting to the passers-by. For me, it's an important way of getting the message across. Other gardeners will scuttle away and just get on with, with doing the weeding. This is Luke in Montreal, who you can see on the left began with um, some dirt, windblown dirt and a few tree pits on the edge of a street in Montreal and he's an extremely um, competent gardener and has filled this up with um, a beautiful mixed bed which happens to be next to a nursery. It wasn't a consideration of his at the time but the nursery were incredibly appreciative of it. They've helped him out by giving him a bit of funding um, and between his love of gardening, I mean he lives around the corner, and their pride and, and I suppose their marketing for, for parents to send their children there, the, the project has flourished and he's got to know uh, his community better. Uh, a new group uh, began earlier this year in Los Angeles. Uh, incredibly, uh, a city you'd think is manicured to, to beyond perfection, uh, still has scraps of potential which few, are, well no one as far as I'm aware are arguing with over there just off Sunset Boulevard and... Um, you can see they, they go for the um, publicising with a, with a signpost there, with a bit of Banksy artwork on it. Though um, in London we prefer the, the conversational technique. I think in LA perhaps you just don't have so many people walking along the street, you need something a bit more uh, um, intrusive. I found these photos just this morning. Uh, I, I don't know who they are, but these are Dutch guerrilla gardeners. Um, I know one of, I think, the Green Left Party in, in the Netherlands has been um, doing a lot to, to get people interested in guerrilla gardening, um, making both useful um, clothing points here. The high-vis jacket is extremely valuable for the guerrilla gardener because it's the universal uniform of someone in an official um, health and safety considering position. Um, the, the use of the eye masks is something I hadn't seen before, but <laughs> perhaps it helps focusing the eyes. Um, here in Milan, we have um, some modest guerrilla gardening, not quite living up to the um, stylish reputation that I'd have expected from the, the capital of international fashion, but uh, a few lavender and rosemary and some geraniums, I think, being added around a, a rather um, roughly installed plant, a tree there. In, I think this is in Brisbane. It's certainly in Australia somewhere. Uh, Nisaba is the name she goes by, has been dumping gold tires around and using those to plant in along the nature strips. In Chicago, again, the, the classic nocturnal tree pit transformation. And in uh, London and in Santa Barbara, I think they're both tree pits. I, I show uh, Sean on the left because he is actually partially sighted. That doesn't stop him. So if anyone out there is tempted to, 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 to get guerrilla gardening and is thinking of excuses, don't let lack of vision get in the way. It's not just uh, formal planting and, and neat little beds of, of herbaceous plants. Uh, in England, there's the wild flower meadow movement that's gaining popularity. In fact, I know this is a big deal in Germany as well. Um, Britta there uh, transformed a traffic island by sowing that meadow uh, in, two, in 97 and 2003, I think. In Toronto, the Toronto, the Public Space Committee, who are a group of activists who get involved in a wide range of different urban issues, whether it's raising awareness of the underground rivers, um, whether it's about removing the hurricane fencing that a lot of people put around their gardens and is, is considered actually pretty unnecessary. Uh, they also have a guerrilla gardening wing and in the spring um, go around planting. One year it was marigolds, last year uh, I think it was um, busy lizzies. A graffiti artist in Toronto there with um, his boxes and in Mexico hanging baskets showing that actually you can take it off the land. In Plymouth, more transformation. In the countryside and in Brussels, check out brussels-farmer.blogspot.com, a very uh, active group who focus entirely on planting sunflowers which are a, a plant that is symbolic not only of, of the beautification of our cities, but is also a very productive plant um, for bird food, um, for spreads, for fuels, and they actually remove uh, lead from the ground as well. They're a good plant for detoxifying soils. 
we did the sunflower planting in May this year uh, in, a, in a high risk location in a remarkably overgrown bindweed ridden rose bed opposite the Houses of Parliament. A pretty quick um, dig this was. This is not a place we wanted to hang around very long. Planting seeds is, is ideal for that. Uh, it took as long to get this photo as it did to actually get the gardening done, I'm ashamed to say. But uh, propaganda is obviously an important part of what we do. And I'm glad to say that the sunflowers bloomed. Uh, it, was, it was heartening. Either the contractors who do mow around there ignored them or, or perhaps they, you know, they appreciated it and, and helped look after it. We went back a few times and weeded them, but it, it just shows you the potential is there, even in places where the pessimists would assume you could never get away with it. Okay, so that is a whistle-stop review of the, the typical form of guerrilla gardening, but we're here to talk specifically about agriculture, and because the audience um, comes from a, a particularly sort of design and academic background. I'm going to show you some of the, the, the more, um, well, the rarer stuff and, and some of the deeper stuff, including the history of guerrilla gardening, well beyond the word guerrilla even existing. What I'm talking about now is the illicit cultivation of someone else's land. And the man who, who I think is, is, is most famous for this and certainly lives on um, in all sorts of um, political writing is Gerard Winstanley, who was an Englishman, uh, actually a textile merchant, um, a pretty religious man, um, a prolific writer, who in 1649, and this is when we've just executed our king, we're, we're heading towards um, a republican state. It's a bit chaotic, really, and a lot of uh, writers, uh, thinkers, um, were trying to map out what um, the ideal population and civilization and society should look like. Of course, the levelers were there. And then there was this group, the true levelers, who became known better as the diggers, who wanted uh, common resources for all, communists bef bef before the word existed. Um, and on April the 1st, 1649, started planting vegetables in the common land outside a village in Surrey. Uh, at the time, a third of the country was common land. It was there to be grazed upon, but not to be cultivated. And initially, they faced very little opposition uh, at all, a bit of suspicion. And actually, the central government at the time, led by Lord Fairfax, had no problem with them at all. He said, leave it to the local authorities. But um, rather like my experience of local authorities, they, they were perhaps a bit less sympathetic. And after a year and a half, despite encouraging other people to be growing vegetables around the southeast, uh, the, the attacks, the imprisonments, the court cases um, wore him down and, and, and he gave up. But his writing lives on today and has inspired a quite a wide range of different activist groups. America has their own... Um, original guerrilla gardener, Johnny Appleseed Chapman, who uh, in a more traditionally American way did it for, for business reasons. He was um, a pioneering orchard man who went ahead into the, the wilderness, um, befriended the, the uh, Native Americans and started planting um, apple trees in, in what um, appeared to be wilderness, and it, it was, but by this point had already been assigned um, in title deed to the landowners back on the East Coast. But John Chapman wasn't worrying about that. He got his apple trees in there, and then as the settlers moved forwards, he then sold on the young trees to them. So guerrilla gardening, in terms of what we get out of it, what we're not fighting against, but what we're getting out of it is is of course beautification, is the food, is the community spirit, are the health benefits of the plants themselves, but also the activity of doing it. We've seen there John um, Chapman and his business motivations, and those are still reflected today, and as a form of expression, and as, as a, a media to use, plants are a, a very potent um, form of expression and, and increasingly popular with, with artists. And these two are all, this lot is all entangled together. I, I started doing this because I like gardening, but I've realized that the benefits are far um, wider than that. So to look specifically at food, well, there's Gerard Wynne Stanley in this 17th century Britain, and the, the equivalent is actually the less developed countries today. The, the world in, in those parts uh, is not so different. Um, in Uganda, uh, a guerrilla gardener um, visited there last spring and took these photos for me. Uh, and I said, look, if you can find informal cultivation, 
see what you can you know see what you can find see what you can photograph see what you can find out from people and of course it's all over the place these roadside verges are, are left um, wide for potential road expansion but uh, farmers both extend their crops into it and those who who are lucky well unfortunate enough not to actually have their own land have been planting maize um, informally uh, along the roadsides um, there's another image and uh, some were well were not very keen to have their photos taken or, or obviously they, they weren't necessarily all around but here uh, Mama Afua was very happy to show off the onions that she'd been planting in, in, in her village um, despite the fact that that is, that is not her land um, it's an old plantation property that has, has become neglected and the plantation is no longer as active as it once was and actually is a place for mass guerrilla gardening although I think they, they, they might feel uncomfortable with that term uh, in Latin America, there are swathes of plantations that the agribusinesses have decided are uh, beyond uh, economic um, workability. They're no longer viable, and they're abandoned. And some of these uh, are actually um, part of c communities. They're not just the fields, but they, they have villages and uh, schools and churches that are all part of the estate. And when the plantations get closed down, the, the people um, are, are not just jobless, but but landless and they resist at times and this photo taken by Sebastião Salgado is of an invasion in, in Brazil of the uh, Panua I think uh, estate um, which was organized by the um, MST movement where they set up home and cultivate you can see their tools there and in America in New York uh, the guerrilla gardening although began more as a community and artistic project, uh, grew in popularity amongst uh, Central and South American communities who uh, came to New York with the skills to really grow food in a way that a lot of the, the, the American students at the time didn't naturally have. They hadn't grown up with that. They'd grown up with going to the supermarkets. And guerrilla gardening for them and subsequently community gardening became a way of being able to grow the food that they couldn't buy in New York because the, the species that um, were, were available were, were not native. And uh, that has grown in popularity. Here we have uh, a guerrilla garden, uh, a pretty famous one that was demolished in 1984 after Giuliani decided to build a tower block on top of it that was uh, largely the work of um, one man called Adam Purple, who I'm going to read a little bit about in a moment. He created this uh, as um, uh, an urban farm in, in downtown Manhattan and came to the, to the garden with um, quite a lot of spirituality as well, which you can see in the form he took. It's a more recent photo. I took these in New York uh, two years ago. We've got Adam on the left, who's a, an old-timer green gorilla. He was there in the 70s, still growing capsicum in his community garden in Hell's Kitchen. And now over in uh, East New York, which is not gentrified in the way Manhattan is now, um, but is still a very poor district, uh, this is uh, Johanna, uh, who is a redundant um, IT worker. Um, she has an incredible garden, a legitimized one now, uh, where... Uh, she's very proud to show off her marrows. In Britain, there is a growing interest now in, in growing food and doing so as guerrilla gardeners. This, this is, it's really happened in, in the last year or so. I think rising food prices, rising fuel prices have, have made the, the need and the interest um, and the fashionability of growing your own vegetables uh, increasingly popular. Um, a couple of celebrity chefs are, are morphing into celebrity vegetable growers, um, it, which I think is always a good barometer of, of, of what's popular. Look at, look at the TV listings. And here, uh, a symbolic attempt um, in Krukern to grow a cornfield outside the local supermarket uh, in what was just a scrappy tree pit uh, is, is one relatively recent example. Unfortunately, in this context, the bright young shoots of the corn were much more attractive as a, a lawn and, and Lily and Noor who helped plant it here with their dad to sort of demonstrate that, that functionality um, well by, by sitting on it so unfortunately the loaf of bread that their dad hoped to make from the, the field uh, never, never arose but it was, a, it was a symbolic gesture and uh, a thoughtful one 
I suppose related to that um, is uh, the the sort of foraging, the the collection, the collecting of uh, produce in cities, even if you haven't planted it yourself. And uh, fallen fruit in uh, Los Angeles uh, are, are prominent within this movement. There's a similar group in Sheffield, and they've been mapping in the city where the fruit trees are, both growing in the street but also growing on private land that hang over onto the street, so that it would seem reasonable, uh, can be harvested. Many of the cherry and plum trees that, that have become popular um, since, since the war, because compared with um, old trees like planes and oaks, they, they have a much smaller uh, root ball, so they don't disrupt the urban fabric, uh, are, are mainly grown, um, beyond those functional reasons, for their pretty blossoms. And a lot of the fruit is, is, is never harvested, so fallen fruit are doing their best to, to encourage people to, to do that. Uh, produce of another kind um, is uh, also popular among some guerrilla gardeners. This photo um, is in uh, Turbingen. I point out the illicit crop growing amongst the otherwise um, colourful display of petunias there in South Germany. Uh, yeah, he's um, one of one of a few. One of a few. I got in a bit of trouble for um, revealing his identity once. So I shall not say anything more. Um, in yesterday's newspaper, um, the, the, uh, the overlap, I suppose, of, of uh, agriculture, urbanism, and, and guerrilla activity um, hit the papers. Um, I'm not, not hugely familiar with the story. This is pretty hot off the press, so I've just pasted this in. Uh, you, can, you can read that the sort of bourgeois family have been uh, living in a farm commune in um, the centre of France in, in a uh, little village uh, called Turnac, I think, Turnac. And uh, unfortunately, they seem to have got caught up with some uh, shopping centre bomb plot um, in Paris. There's a suspicion that they're involved, um, and they've been incarcerated. And some officials said, you know, these types, they start off in eco-terrorism, or the most radical wings of the animal rights movement, and, uh, and anti-capitalists, and they end up, end up trying to bomb people. So... It, there's a fear, there's a, there's a paranoia. I think it's um, extreme, but um, this is where the authorities fear some of this might be heading. I'm glad to say that uh, other authorities um, have realised these issues are uh, important, and uh, just to demonstrate it's not all about anti-establishment, I can raise awareness here on behalf of the United Nations uh, Food and Agricultural Organisation that uh, just under two years ago they launched Food for Cities, which was reported at the time in militaristic terms as a new front in the battle against hunger and malnutrition. And where their focus has been is bringing uh, agricultural skills into the cities of less developed countries, um, creating uh, allotments in, in places like Bogota. Okay, now as um, light relief, uh, I'm going to show you a few slides that are not about uh, agriculture and food growing um, or, or indeed the core of the guerrilla gardening movement but are pretty thought-provoking statements. The most famous of which was on May the 1st, 2000 when uh, the UK activist group Reclaim the Streets took over Parliament Square and installed a temporary garden of apple trees and a pond and some pansies and tulips and covered dear old Winston Churchill's head with a turf Mohican and caused all sorts of damage, uh, which was reported at the time as guerrilla gardening. Uh, it's not gardening if gardening is about actually growing stuff. It's, it's a, it's a low-carbon flower arrangement, an alternative to using petrol bombs. It's much kinder to the environment. Um, so I, I, I think it takes, puts the movement in a, a bit of disrepute, but um, was widely reported. Similarly, £10,000 worth of damage caused after a hole was dug in a motorway back in 1996 um, by the same group who had a good time, you can see. Uh, much more uh, sophisticated and, in fact, far more popular now um, way of making exactly the same gesture of let's reclaim the streets from cars uh, is by the um, quite well-known group Rebar uh, in San Francisco who did this first in September 2006 and have since done it um, in numerous cities across the USA and I believe in, in Europe as well. 
and simply, in fact, pay the parking meter. So you might say this isn't guerrilla activity. They pay the parking meter, roll out um, a, a, a turf park, install a bench, a tree, and provoke people in, into seeing their city in, in a completely new way. And were so provocative uh, and, and liked, in fact, that the following year, the mayor of San Francisco was quite happy for his parking space to be turfed over. Um, I don't think he seemed to see the sort of double standards in then rolling it up and putting his car back uh, the next day. He, he was sort of happy to go along with it as a one-off stunt. But I think the more of, of this kind of um, gesture, the, the, the more people can begin to really sense of, um, how cities could be different. Uh, another version of the same idea, uh, this I came across accidentally in, in Toronto. An old car has been filled to the roof uh, with mud and plants and uh, turf was where the bonnet would be and uh, the, the boot at the back. And they got in trouble here. This, this was not done with a parking permit or parking, me parking meter. So, yeah, I so said this was guerrilla. But li like many um, guerrillas, they were able to get permission incredibly. Uh, they went to court about it, and it was declared uh, by the judge uh, a piece of public art. So it can stay. They're allowed to have it there for six months of the year. And then when it gets snowy in the winter, it has to be wheeled away. Uh, another form of guerrilla gardening here in Rotterdam... Uh, I don't know if Helmut's here. I, I've, we've spoken on email, but we've not um, never met. Um, Helmut here is adbusting, uh, one of several guerrilla gardeners who use plants to uh, obstruct uh, commercial messages in the landscape. Also adopting the high-vis jacket approach, he uh, is planting a tree to obscure this um, billboard, um, though the tree was removed. Um, it was a, a long-term project. More successful was this brilliant uh, piece of guerrilla gardening by Sandy in Portland outside America's oldest Mercedes dealership. Uh, brilliant. I mean, as you can see the before and after there. She just was, felt inspired. She doesn't describe herself as a, an activist, but just, well, wanted to, to provoke and, and make the statement and, and raise a few thoughts. And did so incredibly successfully because that extra bit of box hedge that she matched up was there for 10 days. Mercedes just didn't notice it, um, blind to their own corporate identity. Um, and when they did rip it up, uh, she spotted the box hedge dumped around the corner of the dealership with the bins, and so she dragged it back and put it back in place, and apparently it was there for another few days or so before they ripped it away, and she felt, well, she's, you know, she's made, her, made her statement. Uh, Adbusters magazine have also got involved in this by giving away packets of ivy seeds on their, um, their magazine though I don't know if anyone actually successfully achieved it. Now, the flip side of, of ad busting is when um, corporate um, advertisers jump on the bandwagon. And um, I won't mention them, but you can probably work out who they are. Um, this um, international footwear company um, approached me with a seven-page script of images lifted off my website saying, we want to film a, an advert um, to raise awareness of our tokenistic, they didn't use that word, um, tokenistic eco-shoe. And I said, well, no, it doesn't really make sense, thanks. Um, not a good idea. But they went ahead anyway, and they employed some actors and did an ad um, that was on UK cinemas and did this billboard, which was widely publicised um, in the style press as guerrilla gardening. Except that not only is it paid for advertising space, so it's certainly not guerrilla marketing even, but the plants were plastic. <laughs> I, I, really, I couldn't believe it. I, had, I cycled over to look at this thing. They, they'd sent me, as part of this pack, trying to get me involved in there, their scheme, they sent me this artist's impression of what this would look like. I couldn't, it was just, it was plastic to advertise a low plastic shoe. So this is, this is the flip side. Uh, when, 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 when grassroots movements start flourishing, then they, 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 they get um, appropriated by the corporate world. Um, more uplifting is the Pansy Project, uh, another website you should um, look into. Um, Paul, um, I think, would probably describe himself as an environmental artist. He began this in Manchester about four years ago uh, as a guerrilla gardener, planting pansies wherever he had records that there had been an act of homophobic abuse, whether it was verbal abuse or, or actually physical abuse. And it's been very popular. He, he plants the pansies, he photographs them, he names the, the photograph after the act of abuse. 
So they have pretty colourful names. And he's now done this in London, he's done this in New York, he's done this in Berlin, he's done this in Iceland. In fact, in London, where I took this photo, he had a police escort um, to, to take him around while he did his gardening. And uh, another artist, Catherine Miller, uh, did this project in the early 90s uh, and has played a big part in popularising the concepts of seed bombing. Uh, seed bomb in short, is a self-contained um, blob, bomb, grenade, a capsule, uh, that enables you to grow plants where otherwise they might struggle because it has the compost and in some cases fertilizer and water and seeds within it. But it's ideally suited to a gorilla gardener who doesn't want to hang around uh, in a patch of land for very long or wants to access places over fences that they can't reach very easily. And Catherine here is seed bombing the um, estate of the Raytheon um, arms manufacturing plant as a, a symbolic act. Um, Christopher in Richmond, Virginia uh, has taken the same idea but modelled the seed bombs into the um, evocative shape of a gun. Um, I've sent this photo, uh, I can't remember her name, no, Ava in San, San Diego just getting together with her friends making seed bombs for her, it was the manufacturing process that was the, the, the fun activity. She, the, the seed bombing itself, she said, was pretty quick and fairly uneventful. She just drove down the road, chucked them out of her car window. But uh, getting her friends around to, to roll some clay and get some seeds in was, was um, what it was all about, which is, is brilliant. It's just a reminder of the many different benefits. Um, this image, I'll say this is fake, but um, it is also uh, uh, an increasingly popularised idea, though I've yet to see it work um, very uh, effectively. Um, Helen is a, a, an artist and has the vision of moss graffiti. There is a traditional method of encouraging moss to grow on old limestone um, garden um, ornaments with yoghurt and bits of ground up moss and you paint it on there and it accelerates the natural process of moss growing. But the idea is that if you do this really well, you can actually create shapes and words uh, in moss on walls. And there are all sorts of um, versions using glue that I've seen on the internet, but no real ones yet. So I encourage somebody to really make this work. You need a pretty damp environment. That's the difficulty. You need, moss doesn't grow naturally very easily in cities unless it's pretty damp. Uh, another recent uh, invention by Bloom, the Society Creative in San Francisco, is using bubbles filled with seeds let off the back of um, bicycles to, to gorilla seed sow all over the place. <laughs> Again, the efficacy has yet to be proven, but it shows potential. And, oh, there's a blank slide. And that's about it. That's it. I would say please do check out the website. Um, it's full of stories. It's full of um, advice. There's the community section where you can find out what's happening in your area with links to an increasing number of other blobs, blogs, that is, um, uh, for people in, in, you know, where they live. Uh, I do have a book about it. I brought a few copies with me today that goes into a lot more detail. And, uh, yeah, there we go. I've realised I didn't ever tell you more about Adam Purple and, and, and the soil, but um, it, it's in the book. I, I'll save that for another time. Thank you, Richard. Um, one question that occurs to me right away is, um, have you ever grown produce in Elephant and Castle and actually eaten it? Mm, I have. I have. Um, I've grown Swiss chard. Uh, Swiss chard is, is great because it's a particularly colourful crop, so it sort of you know, did, the, did the beautification thing as well as um, productive. And tomatoes, and I've recently planted an apple tree. Uh, the Swiss chard was absolutely revolting. Uh, <laughs> I, it's not a vegetable I eat regularly anyway, so I don't know whether it was the location or my cultivation or what it's naturally like. Respect, it was, anyway. It was horrible. Yeah, I tried it. I was advised strongly against it. And this is the issue of urban farming, and, and I, I should have touched on the soil section, really, because the, the, the soil can be polluted, and there are all sorts of um, bioremediation techniques that you can use, whether it's sunflowers drawing out the lead, uh, or oyster mushrooms help draw out toxins from the soil as well. You, you don't need to you know, apply it with all sorts of leaching chemicals. You, you can actually... Uh, grow crops that you're not going to eat for the first year or so to clean up the soil um, and, then, and then eat the stuff. Or import soil. 
in fact. Great, thanks. There was a question right there. Um, so years ago, I received uh, a leaflet in my um, post box at home from the municipality where I live, and it's, it announced that I had decided to cut on the budget for the maintenance of the public green, and the leaflet showed pictures of three different levels of maintenance, with uh, the lowest level showing really dirty plots with um, can, cans of Coca-Cola in it and uh, doggy poop and things like that in it. And the best one or the highest level was like what you would expect from the public green, well-maintained, healthy plants and everything. And then it had this red square around the level of maintenance that was selected for your particular living area. <laughs> and mine was like the lowest. Wow. <laughs> and um, I, I wonder if, if this would be um, a tendency in more municipalities. Would something like guerrilla gardening be an opportunity for the people from an area like where I live to, to pick this up and to try to get a higher level? Or so? De okay. Definitely, definitely. And okay. if you think that the context where guerrilla gardening seems to flourish most, if, if you think of um, you know, European cities, is one of two extremes. Either when there are cutbacks, whether it's economic decline, um, cities lacking funds, deprived areas, such as Berlin uh, in recent years where there's been a lot of guerrilla gardening going on uh, of a scale that is more like what New York was, was in the early 70s. These are big community gardens being, being built, although um, the Rosa Rose Garden, which is quite well publicised, unfortunately has just been demolished. So that as a solution to a city that otherwise couldn't look after the land or the private um, owners not being interested in making use of their land is, 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 is great. The other extreme, and this was my context, was London, until recently a booming city, land prices going through the roof, me not being able to afford a house with a garden, making use of the scraps of land that fall through the, the system, that are lost in, in confusion between boundaries. And enlightened cities are recognising that if they can encourage um, and, or just permit their populations to, to look after the public space, then they're onto a winner because their limited resources can be put into doing things that local people don't necessarily have the skills for. And that's what's happened in, in New York. The community gardening movement uh, was embraced eventually. Uh, in Vancouver as well, uh, guerrilla gardening on nature strips uh, it, it relatively um, rapidly encouraged um, the Vancouver Green Streets Initiative where they now provide guidelines uh, for what, what you can do, but it's pretty much a blank canvas. And my understanding also is that in Amsterdam, I in the early 1980s, the, um, sort of the punk movement, uh, the, the, the squatters, they were pulling up paving stones and planting little gardens uh, that uh, in, in English we, we would call facade gardens, but there is a particular Dutch word that I should know. I wouldn't be able to say yes or no, but it, that, that, that um, was being done informally. You know, Amsterdam in the early 80s was, was a, 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 not such a, by any means, a manicured place and gentrified place as it is now. And in the 80s, uh, the local authorities in, in some areas began to encourage this. And I met, uh, I should know her name, I should know all the Dutch anecdotes from this book, but I've forgotten them. I met her, she's a landscape architect and she works with the city now on days where they will remove more of these slabs, they'll provide soil and they'll provide the first plants, but work with the local people in taking responsibility for these little patches outside their, their homes and shops. And, and that to me is of great encouragement, but in London the, that, that would seem incredibly exotic and, and, and laid back. The, the authorities, um, I'm embattled with them again, actually. You can look at the website if you want to know the latest story there. It's very, very upsetting. So he's got the, he's got the microphone. Um, now I think that this is a bit a uh, fashioned uh, guerrilla movement in the world. No? And the political movement of the guerrilla uh, tried to take the power directly. Uh, Harvard teach uh, guerrilla wars in the economy how to occupy uh, the spaces that the corporations cannot occupy because they are so big and the little spaces that 
there are, there are in, in the big spaces are uh, occupied by the guerrilla. <coughs> I think that when the, <coughs> the legality of the guerrilla uh, take the place, uh, in one sense, uh, this movement lose the power. When you said that you are trying to be legal, no? or something like this, yeah. I think that the most strong effect of your movement is uh, just the illegality, because it has the, the shock effect. Mm. And when this activity will be <coughs> regulated by the system, because it is legal, uh, you will have problems, you will have uh, some efficient uh, work to do. Mm. Then what do you do you think about this? I, 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 I think, think, I think we're in agreement. Um, <coughs> what I should, 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 should clarify is that um, when I say trying to go legal, I, I, well, I don't mean that. What, I, what I'm saying is I'm accepting if somebody wants to legalize what I'm doing, uh, that's fine. I, I will accept that. But w the re regulations that may come with that, um, I, I, I resist. And the, this, the, the, I think that the best example is, is in New York because it's where the guerrilla gardening has, has been going on longest. And I, talking to Adam about it and Donald, they, they said that there was a, a struggle, an internal struggle within the movement as to how legitimate they could go. And, and some people were adamant that any kind of dialogue or cooperation with the authorities uh, was incompatible, that it wouldn't work. Um, but the, the alternative was to say, this is what we do, I accept it. This is what we do, accept it. We will do it within these spaces, and you can support us, but this is what we want. So it's about winning um, the argument, uh, the territory, on your terms. And the, the reason why I think, therefore, guerrilla gardening is the way to to start it and to go about it. And in my case, I, I actually only have permission in one location. I have never sought permission in any location. It's just that in that particular place, um, my local housing office came to me, um, having started to garden there and destroy my garden, to, to negotiate. Um, having you know, quite literally dropped a few bombs, um, we had to come to the negotiating table and we're, we're still there. But I, I, I don't have sorry I don't I don't have permission in those other places. But my, my point is, if you start by actually doing it, by showing somebody this is what I want to achieve, and by doing it, and by sticking at it, and by being committed, then they're not questioning your dreams, they're not questioning your your hopes. They're questioning something that is actually there and can be discussed and can be uh, involve a lot more people. I mean that. The, the one place where I do have permission, they said to me, you would never have got it had you come to us first and discussed it because they wouldn't have trusted me to, to look after it and I wouldn't have been able to win round my neighbours um, because who were they to believe that I would be able to turn this into some beautiful garden? They don't need to believe it. They can see it there. So I, I, I'm, a, I'm a great believer in just, just go and do it. And ideally, if you can do that without getting in anyone's face, which is why we do it in the evening. We're not trying to provoke that aggressively. Uh, we're, we're provoking gently and subtly and slowly in some cases as well. If you're planting these sunflower seeds and bulbs, it's, it's not an overnight transformation of shock and awe, although some guerrilla gardening is like that. It's very slow. Some people wouldn't yeah. even notice. You know, where do those sunflowers come from? They've taken three months to appear. Well, and let's not forget that there's also the element of taking the piss out of the notion of guerrilla here, right? I'm not saying yeah, there's no there's potential. A, there's a it, playfulness, right? and I, 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 I know some people are. Uh, uh, well, in the German language, the word guerrilla has much more um, aggressive connotations, and I know um, two guerrilla gardeners are there who are very uncomfortable with the word. Obviously, Germany has a more recent history of guerrilla urban warfare, and they're much more comfortable with the term um, pirate gardening, uh, gar pir piratengarten, which in, in, in English would sound silly. We don't think of ourselves as pirates at all. And we had a long discussion over dinner about, is it pirates or gorillas? But um, we, we agree to, 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 to differ on that. <laughs>
Oh, right. I'm oh, sorry. You want to go first? I think you were. Yeah. Um, actually, I have a few things. Uh, my main thing was what the gentleman before me already addressed, like the, the striving towards legalization. For me, it's like uh, the wrong way to go. Mm -hmm. Also, because we as an Amsterdam Guerrilla Gardening Collective also believe uh, connected to the whole climate change subject. And we believe that the climate change offers us uh, an opportunity to start organizing bottom up. And guerrilla gardening is one of those great community things that serves another purpose of feeding ourselves. Um, actually, that was my main point. The other points were, do you use seeds many, or do you mainly plant plants? Mm -hmm. like um, I, I mainly plant plants. You yeah. Go around Rather than sowing seeds. Or um, seed bombs. Because I can be more certain of their success. Um, seeds are cheaper. Uh, seeds are, are, are more... Um, you know, the, the, the vagaries of nature. Um, I mean, I, I, sunflowers, flax seeds, California poppies, forget-me-nots, they're brilliant for seed sowing. But a plant like lavender grown from seed is, is hard, slow work. Um, it would be great if I had a greenhouse or a, a conservatory somewhere I could grow things from seed um, at, at home. But um, <laughs> Yeah. Yes, yeah, so if I could find some sort of secret enclosure... Um, I, I've tried a few trays of things at home and it's very difficult um, in my flat, but I, I'm sure I will improve. So I have a, a question that it's um, very much to do with, you know, what political strategies are effective now and what, um, what counts as a beautiful garden. So coming from Australia, mm. um, which is a continent that's been terrorised by formal beautiful English gardens, mm. literally raped and um, destroyed yes. and, Roses. you know, uh, yes, and, and these formal beautiful, you know, lavenders and, you know, geraniums and arranged to defy and to exclude and, and to um, create a vision of a beautiful formal garden. Um, so there's something at stake about what counts as beautiful and I think what's a good example is the <laughs> the parking day events, which have, as you said, have been tremendously popular and have gone on in, in a number of cities. And I spent actually this last year picking up all the toxic turf from each of the, um, uh, the parking day, um, 60 parking day uh, parks, mm. and looking at what vision of natural systems they produced. First of all, they use sod, right? Could there be a less natural, more toxic mm. substance to use? No. I mean, they, it would have been better for them to use plastic, right? Mm. It would have actually been a more effective view of... Uh, and was it a... Um, did it produce or reproduce uh, a retrograde nostalgia that has nothing to do with the kinds of natural systems ideas that we really need to grapple with at this point? Mm. And secondly, you know, putting the park bench there in the, you know, again, reproducing and, you know, the English colonial view of a mm. beautiful formal garden, which is being perpetrated through yeah. um, a pseudo, um, alter, you know, a, yeah. a pseudo alterity when, you know, there's a lot at stake here. So I, I, th I think my a final point is, is, does it, is this nostalgic and retrograde, or is it actually claiming new territory, claiming new ideas, is it generating, can it be? And particularly now, now, and I suppose I wanna, I wanna kind of put this to the point, because five years ago, I would have done the No Park Project by having a street party, getting a, a license, putting up a, a, and we planned it this way, to put up a stage, put a, a, a noisy thrash band on the, stage and put the concrete cutters underneath the stage while the thrash band was mm. playing. Yeah, and that's then how <laughs> that hole was dug in right. the um, M41. Right, yeah. and then uh, apologizing. But I think that strategy may not be the most effective no, now, not. where um, seizing authority, you know, seizing, seizing both, the, uh, both the, you know, lead, it's nice that, you know, who's, who's researching the protocols to actually effectively take up the most dangerous neurotoxicant. Mm. I mean, it's not, it's not a, it's, it, the informal gardening doesn't provide the 
authoritative license to do this urgently well and with precision, right? It's nice that there is FIDA remediation, but who's kind of supporting people to really investigate how effective that's been? You know, whether it's, you know, so I, what I'm asking is that you're dealing with these really important questions. Mm -hmm. You're creating a wonderful um, community to address them, but are we really going anywhere with it? Okay, lots of points out. To start with, the issue of what one plants and whose vision of beauty um, you know, should prevail. And that is, that is a question that um, gardeners uh, ask of themselves, whether they're guerrilla gardeners or not. What is an attractive garden or not? It's what happens at Chelsea um, Flower Show e every year, being judged for being thought-provoking and, and proficient and, and attractive. There is a romance uh, in a lot of gardening and in London, what um, the gardens that I've been planted, uh, the form they've taken is, is very much the traditional um, English garden. But importantly, not traditional what is native to this particular location, but particularly what is naturally actually able to grow here in this urban environment. So lavender, whilst being considered traditionally English, is not native to England at all. It's a Mediterranean plant and ideally suited to the dry, um, inhospitable, um, uh, warm, um, exhaust-ridden environments of London streets and provides fragrance and something that is visibly growing to people all year round in the way that um, herbaceous plants, for example, wouldn't. Uh, I, I'm fascinated by what people choose to plant in, in, in different parts of the world and uh, a recent visit to South Africa, and I, I know from Gorilla Gardeners in Australia, have both shown me that returning to native plants that are not the um, thirsty uh, European um, immigrants that were popular uh, a, a few years ago, a return to native plants not only is far more sustainable, and that the, the central reservations in Johannesburg now are full of um, beautiful uh, South African plants rather than the rose beds, um, it's not only more sustainable, but it's a, a demonstration of a national identity and a sense of, of what we are. Uh, and in Australia, that, that I think that's even more important because most of the people growing these things um, are, are the immigrants as well. And they're, they're in, in recent years, getting in touch with the, the, the country they've landed in. Um, so that, in terms of what you choose to grow, I think it's... It's a big discussion in the same way it is for, for, for other gardeners, but you, you, you need to be sensitive to it. It isn't about imposing um, English um, flower beds all, all around the world. As for the lawn, well, the lawn is the tarmac of the horticultural world. Um, lawn mowers are, are more pollutive um, th than cars. I can't remember the statistic, but it, l lawns across America, and read um, Heather Flora's book, um, Food Not Lawns, if you want the full horror stories. But the chemicals that people pour onto them, the mowing, to get that um, English perfection it is uh, a, a pretty obscene, really. And I agree that the, the, the rebar project, um, and there was another um, funded by the Mayor of London project to cover Trafalgar Square with turf for one week, are, are, are troublesome. Because although they uh, address one point uh, in, a, in a populist and thought-provoking way of saying, oh, look, we don't need to have cars here, we could have a garden, they choose the iconic and yet very pollutive form of uh, the lawn to make that point, which I, I think um, is changing. It was, it was great to see your use of the same canvas um, was, was addressing those issues, even if not explicitly. So I, th I think that's great. Um, in terms of our authority and, and, and how qualified are we to, to do this, well, I, to me, I don't think that's Im important. Uh, amateur gardeners um, c can achieve a lot, even if their aims are, are, are not immense, and even if um, they, they don't have the, 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 the academic background. Uh, partly, if you're guerrilla gardening, you're doing so in public. So. I, I know from, from gardening now, people are assuming things about what we're doing, about our motivations, uh, about the form of our garden, that were certainly not our intentions at all. So just being out there, uh, as artists would know, you, 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 people see things in, in your work that you, you didn't necessarily intend. And I, I, I think, I, mean, I don't know 
any any grid garden who would see bioremediation as their primary aim for for, for, for for doing their activity. But if that's one of the many benefits that comes out of, of what they do, um, then that, that is that is to be encouraged. And and I, I invite you to to share your, your scientific background with the guerrilla gardening movement because there's a lot of enthusiasm out there. Um, but um, uh, the more weight, the better. Hey, thank you, Richard. I think we have you know, collected quite a bit of material that you know, we can use for the uh, discussion after the, the coffee break. Um, I mean, there is the question of, of, of politics and uh, the question of what it means of, you know, to, to struggle, to come back to a term that René didn't like this morning. There's also the question of romanticism versus some, well, I think Bruce calls it spine wrangling, because of the fu fu future, futurist, uh, high-tech, uh, 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 adequate designing, uh, whatever. Um, so, I mean, there is loads of stuff, and uh, it would be great to see all of you back uh, after the coffee break.